So what I wanted to do right today on this lovely weekend afternoon that I got going on here, it's sunny, is if we type in a text file, we have a thing to read through our, our prompts or our shell, not really shell, but our shell commands and then our files and programs to load and run. So file table is a text file and this will attempt to print it to the screen because it is designated as a .txt extension. I'm just printing everything out as ASCII characters, but I'm not handling hex characters right now. All I am doing is just printing out whatever's in the file, and that might not be valid. Printable ASCII, or visible ASCII, so I'm going to change this a little bit. Uh, the character that we get from the file, I'm just going to compare it to hex f, or well, 15 in decimal, if it's less than or equal. I'm going to convert that hexadecimal to ASCII by using our, our print hex as ASCII command, although I think I'm going to rename this and not print it. I think I'm just going to make this a conversion. Let's let's do that. And I'm going to I'm going to call it a hex to ASCII. I'm going to convert our hex to ASCII. So this won't really work with um uh, basically any ASCII character below, you know, wherever I expect the principal characters to start. So anything like a backspace or carriage return or a line feed will not really work with this, but this is just real basic right now. We're going to convert to ASCII and then we're going to print. So that's all. Otherwise, we're just going to print it out and we should be good to go on that, hopefully. But I'm going to change this. Instead of print hex as ASCII, I'm going to call it hex to ASCII or H2A, I guess, would be in a C library, right? And I'm not going to print this out. I'm going to handle, you know, wherever the code's going to print. I think the only thing using the print hex to ASCII or print hex as ASCII that I was doing would be the print file table. This has this print hex as ASCII. And it is only in here, I think just right here. So that is okay. Hex to ASCII, if I put that back, overwrite. And we'll change this as well. And once more. What I could do is a global find and replace, but I don't remember exactly how to do that at the moment, so... I think we're good there. Alright. And we'll save the kernel, no changes needed. Go back to our terminal. So I do have the make file here. I'm gonna make a change to the make file as well. And I'm gonna run clean by default in OS. So here I'm gonna go... Well, actually I can just put it first, right? So I'm gonna... I'm gonna run clean here first. So that way it will remove all the binaries and then it'll make all the binaries and then can cat them together. So that way I don't have to do make clean and make OS. I can just run make OS or just make. I think run, let's get rid of this. We'll just have run do the box command. So this way I can type make and then ampersand ampersand and then make run and it should build and run it. So I think that'll be a little bit better, a little bit easier, but we can test that out. If we run make, it should clean up and then make all the files. Undefined symbol FH, beautiful. Guess I can't really do that. Can I do 0FH? Let's see if that works. That does work, okay. And then make run should run box and it should run the program. And it does, all right. Let's move this into the middle. So if we run our file table command, it should print out the file table with the hexadecimal characters now, hopefully, and not give all the garbage which it didn't really, it stopped at zero. So it should have converted and then printed out whatever was in AL. If it was less than or equal to F, it would convert it to ASCII. And then right now it just stopped, so that's good. I'm moving into AH, zero E, which I'm already doing that, so maybe I don't need to do that again. Comparing, adding to AL, and then returning, okay. I think another thing I'm gonna do is pad these out. Since one hexadecimal digit is one nibble, or four bytes, let's just print all these out, because this is actually what's going to be stored, and it makes a little bit more sense if we do this. So now those take up full byte values, which should be all right. All right, so if we print out our file table, which is our directory command, so that doesn't work either. Okay, so entry doesn't start sector size, because I'm not printing it out inside of our print file table. So let's change that as well. Why don't we just break everything while we're at it? That would be good. Oh, I'm not calling. I'm jumping less than or equal, but then it returns. That's why it's not working. That makes more sense. Okay, let's go back to where I have this um, right here. So I'm doing a jump less than or equal. This needs to be a call if I want to do this. 
So I jump, I need to jump back, so that's why that is not working. The call should work, but this doesn't because it's... Okay. So I need to do a call if it's less than or equal. Which is always fun. I'm going to put that uh, here. I'll put call h2a. Uh, jump less than or equal, let's call this call h2a. And then what this will do is call hex to ASCII, and then it'll jump back. It'll jump to, um... Oh, this is annoying. Okay. So I need another thing here, because I don't want to jump back here. I want to jump back to here. I did not take that into consideration. Let's do that. Jump return file character. This is verbose and is not really what I wanted to do, but that's all right. We'll do this. And then this will jump back. This will loop back to here. This should be all right. So we'll jump to convert it, which I have here, which just calls so that the return works better for the stack. And then it'll go back to here. It'll print it out, increment. We should be good on there. Okay. And the print file table, we just need to add an int 10 to print out the character wherever I have the hex to ASCII, because this doesn't print anymore. So after I call and it returns, we'll print out whatever we got. Hex to ASCII, int 10h. And I think that's the only places we have it, so let's hope that that works. All right, that works for directory command. Okay, so if we print out the file table, actually let's do, um, I'll clear the screen with our command, all right. And I typed that wrong. It now prints this out. And that is correct since we have a ton of zeros. Since we're padding out the file table with zeros, this is correct indeed. So let's see, just to make sure. So we have bootsec, we have spaces, then we have our bin. We have our zero, our one, our one with these. Then we have the kernel spaces in the bin. Zero, two, three. File table space text, zero, five, one. And calculator bin 061. Okay. And then we have zeros padded out to 512 from this. So this is now correct and this works. Although if I were to embed um, literal new line characters, this would not work since it would print out an A and a D <laughs> for the new line instead of printing out their regular ASCII white space equivalent since I'm just doing a basic check if it's below, you know, 15 here, 0F. Uh, but that's pretty good. So that does print out all valid ASCII characters now. So that's nice. It just doesn't handle white space characters. So I guess all ASCII characters would not be the correct thing, but uh, there's another thing in here I wanted to do, which was get rid of one of these to-dos, but it's failing search. Oh, I do have one up here. This is what I wanted, yeah. So I don't need to do this. I, I can get rid of that. Let's also change these since I'm doing my other nomenclature for hex values. Just doing a tiny bit of yak shaving here. That's all we're doing. Make sure everything still shows up right. Those are good. And make sure that still works. And we'll make sure calculator program still works. Clear the screen. Okay, we're good. Um, I can add a couple registers maybe to the print file or the uh, the print registers command. I got the extra segments. Well, DSNE. I don't have FS or GS, but that is okay. But I can also do the stack segment, I think. So let's do that. Try to print the stack at least. We'll see if it works or not. Let's move an S here for SS. I don't know if this will work. If it doesn't, that's fine. I'll get rid of it. But let's see if we can print the stack segment. So print registers. Just wanted to add the stack segment there. Just because we can. And now we'll get to something maybe more Fun, I think I want to start on an editor. I'm not sure if an editor is considered part of the OS or not. I guess if you're using like something closer to the original, the original Unix or a BSD, then their whole um, kernel and user space, their whole system is developed together and more tightly integrated than Linux, which is just the kernel. Whereas the Linux kernel doesn't really, I don't think, include an editor by default. Maybe it has Nano or something in there. I'm not positive. That'd be defined by POSIX, right? Which I think defines Vi to be available if possible. But um, and what I mean by that rambling is I want to make a, an editor, a text editor. 
at the very least, maybe a machine monitor to where you can type in uh, binary or hexadecimal machine code and then execute it in memory and run it sort of like, well, not really an interpreter, but sort of like that. Like you would type in a high level language code and interpret and run it. We would do that for machine code. And I think traditionally that's called a monitor, like a hex monitor. So I kind of want to start on that, but then I might make it modal, but not like VI or Emacs modes, but more like have a hexadecimal mode where I have this monitor and then have like a, maybe a regular text mode where I just type in um, ASCII characters, which may not be hex. They can just be regular printable alphanumeric. And then maybe we can save that as a different file type and make a assembler compiler or something. I don't know, but I can start out with an editor and a hex monitor mode, say. So I want to start on that and I'll do that with the help of my friend, Mr. Blueberry Coffee, who I have been sorely neglecting so far, but now he is part of the fray and we will get on our merry way. So how would I go about making an editor here? Well, I want to make um, either a separate folder for binaries may be the wrong word, but since we have our our bin in our source here, I guess we'll put it in source. I don't know if I want to make a separate folder for like user space programs or something compared to system provided programs, which I think is sbin versus bin in regular Unix. I don't really know the, hier the hierarchy I want to do in my folder structure here yet. Um, but we have ASM, which is just generic ASM, uh, our regular system programs, our source files, kernel boot sector, our file table, and our calculator, which is, you know, pretty much just empty right now. But then we also have print, which has our, our print functions and that I laid out. And then our screen, which at the moment just has a reset screen function, I'm pretty sure. So I can make something else and either call it editor or um, just, I don't really know, what would be a good name for a folder that's going to hold this and other programs? So our main bin, I guess, will hold our compiled programs. But I want to put the source to something else. Let's just call it editor, that's fine. We can rename it or do some different later. We'll do editor.assemb. All right, and we will move and we'll find that file. I guess I'll call it a text editor with uh, modes, which I might put in later. Okay, so let's put our stuff in our kernel. Let's go to the bottom it in our include files because I guess we'll just include this as part of the kernel so I guess it will be a system space program by default that's okay I don't really have any I don't have to deal with privileges or escalation or switching between user and system mode or whatever um, until later if I want to enter protected mode right now it's all just one and it's pretty it's it's simpler to think of that way so let's just include our uh, Assembly. Well, this will be in this file, so we don't need to do the dot dot. We can just do one dot for the current folder. This will be our editor. The ASM. All right. Let's make a uh, let's make a command for that. So we'll call it. What do we want to do? I guess I'll still put these down here for now. Command what editor? Maybe. I'll just call it editor. Launch editor program. And we can look for our editor here. All right, put that back. Command editor. And we're going to jump equal if it is right. We want to jump to our editor program. Call it launch editor. But I guess if we make this an actual program on the disk, then we could run it with our code that we have to run stuff. So maybe I should do that instead. Or um, we'll make it a program. We'll get rid of this. Let's put it in our, uh, our file table. It's our calculator. Our calculator doesn't do anything, so I don't know if I want to keep that, but I guess I could right now. We'll just put it at the end. Three, four, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and we'll put our single quote. This will be a binary file. Um, it's starting entry. It will be at sector seven by default. And right now, it's just gonna fill up. We can have it fill up to two sectors, I guess. 
Oh, we can start with one. Let's just start with one. We'll increase it as need be. Nothing wrong with that. And that'll find and launch it if it's in the seventh sector, which means that I write that. All right. Need to change the make file then to run it. There's a way to do loops in the make file as well, right? I think there is. I can loop through all sources in a file, make them all into binaries, and then instead of doing all this, because that would probably make this a bit easier, run the same commands over all of them. I'll look into that after this video sometime. Because that would you know, eliminate me typing all these things out by hand, which is all right. Assembly and move source sim editor.bin to this folder. Oh, just one. All right, and we'll move and we'll concatenate that onto the end here. Editor.bin. And at the end of this, we're gonna do, you know, our sector padding. Uh, which is what, times 512 at the moment. Minus dollar, minus dollar, dollar, find by zero. All right, so to start off with this, since it's gonna be included in our kernel, we can call everything else that's included because it'll be in the same, you know, sort of memory space here. I guess we can print out just a message here to test that it's working, but uh, what do I wanna do? Well, I wanna probably start off, start off with a blank screen, right? We'll start off in hexadecimal mode, which I guess I'll make more explicit as we go on, but we'll start off by clearing the screen. Um, right, I'll start off by clearing the screen. Okay, and we basically want to loop through and the user can print um, what they type in. We're going to print the screen. And if we want to do a hexadecimal monitor, then we'll have to go to where they started typing and then where they end. So we'll need a way to end input explicitly. And then we'll need to run whatever they put in. Or be able to save it to disk or something. I don't really know. But I guess I want to take in user input. Let's try it out what we want to do here. Let's take in user inputs and print the screen. And we'll say when done with inputs, convert to valid machine code and run. So let's just start with that. We're going to assume we're in hex mode to start off. And what I can do here before we do all this is just for testing, debugging, so I'll put testing. Let's move into AX, we'll move 0E, right? <laughs> to AH, and then into AL, we'll move something like a T. Very well. I don't think I can do that. A T is hexadecimal 54, decimal 84, so we can move 54 for a T. And then call H to see if the T works. So we'll take in a keystroke and then jump back to the kernel. I did control C for Windows copy, not Alt W or what have you. Okay. And we'll jump back to the kernel here. And editor. Hopefully this is all right. But it should print out a T and then take a keystroke and go back to the kernel and reload all that. And we can't do that. Invalid value. Nice. Oh, also, I don't need to include the editor because we're going to make it on the disk. Yeah. Don't need to do that. Undefined symbol. That's always good. Include one back. It is in screen. Reset text screen. Let's see if that works. Okay. So to check if we added it to the file table, there we go. Editor, binary, entry zero, starts in sector seven, goes for one sector. Okay. So if we run the editor, one, two, three, four because we put in literal spaces into the file name and the file table. So this should print out a T and then wait for input and then go back to the kernel screen, the, you know, the welcome to case OS. And that is what it does. Okay. So I know how to write and run programs at a basic level. That's good to know. You know, what I can do is include 
print string, right? Let's do that as well. It's called print string, right? Let's do that as well. Move into SI something. Let's have our very. I don't know if I want to do variables at the bottom still or do them at the top. Because at work, we do all our stuff at the top because it's needed, because it's IBM and that's how they define our language we use. But um, basically, it has all our constants and variables and everything at the top of a block, sort of like C, and then it evolves. And that might make the assembler work a little better too. It wouldn't have to do multiple passes if it already has the thing. I don't know. But um, I can define variables up here, I suppose variables or otherwise other stuff that we need so up here I'm gonna have a string that we want to write I'll just call it test string I suppose this I'm gonna have be a constant because I can oh it's got a zero though so I can't really do that can I I don't think I can do this can I with a comma and then that maybe I can let me see if this works. Then I can move SI test string and call print string. I want to try separate ways of uh, writing things here. Extra characters on the line. So no, this does not work. Okay, that is okay. We can do it like this all the same. Okay, so let's run our editor. One, two, three, four. Eventually, I don't want to do that. Prefetch cs.limit, so that's not good. Okay, that's all right. So it doesn't work with this up here, maybe? I'm not sure. Let's test something. Yes, okay, so I can't have that first. That's interesting, but all right. Well, I guess we'll keep doing it at the bottom then, because that didn't really work. So reset. So let's have whatever we did for a key loop, right? So how did we do that? It's right here at the beginning. Key loop. I'm probably going to do something like this again and put it into here. But also what I want to do is... If we want to do hexadecimal mode, which I guess will be in hex mode to start off, I kind of want to print out two characters at a time and then have a space. Let's do hex dump on our OS dump then. So this prints out four though, or one word at a time, but basically you have four hex digits, which is two sets of two nibbles. So this is one byte and this is another byte. But I think I'm gonna have them put in one byte at a time, at least to start off. So I wanna print out two characters that the user inputs and then a space, and then they'll print out their two characters again. And then we'll need some way to, uh, to end their input and then we'll go and run it. So how am I going to do that? I need to keep a running total, and if they're at two characters, then we'll print out a space. So we will start by XOR and RCX here. Reset counter. Reset byte counter. And then like over here, I'll do, I guess, key loop or input loop. I'll call it hex um, input loop or get next hex character or something. Uh, I call it get next hex character. Long and verbose, but that is okay. And I'll call this, I don't know, init or a uh, or reset or something, start. I'll reset editor. In case we want to put in something to reset, we'll do this. All right, get next hex character. So let's do XOR AX. Do int 16h, which will get our keystroke here. So we're going to get one character. We're going to print it to screen. Move ah0e. I guess we'll compare to enter to start off, but we need another way. I think old CPM used a dollar as the as the terminating character, so we can do that. Let's see. We'll say they enter in a dollar and they're done with input, right? So let's compare. AL with the dollar sign. And if they are at the end, we'll, um, we'll run or something. Execute. We'll do execute input. Otherwise, they're not at the end. We're going to print out the character. Okay, increment RCX. CX. 
compare it to two. And if we're at two, let's do call. We'll print out a space character if, there, if it is two, and then we'll go back to get the next one. That should be simple enough, right? I'm gonna do get next hex char. Let's do that instead. Slightly shorter, still hopefully unambiguous. So we need a couple of labels here. One, we need execute inputs. And two, we need print space. And all print space is gonna do is move into AL a space. So how do we wanna execute the input? Well, if our program is gonna be loaded at a hexadecimal 8,000 for the memory location, we're clearing the screen. I guess we're going to input characters. I'm assuming these characters will be at location x8000. x8000. So when they enter in a character, um, we kind of want to store that to this location in memory. And then we can jump back to the start of this location, which is 8000. And then we can execute the code that they entered. I'm not sure because we'll have to run, we'll have to convert what they entered into valid machine code, which is just converting to converting ASCII to hex, whatever they enter. If they enter it in E9 as ASCII characters, I just want to convert that to E9 and hexadecimal, or, you know, 14, 9, or whatever, and then run that code. So we'll have to get rid of the spaces when they actually run it. We'll have to skip over the space. But um, we'll also just kind of execute whatever they ran. I don't, I'm not really sure how to do that. So what we need to do is say wherever the start of something is, or we can input to a a variable, another memory address, a label. We can put in whatever they enter into a label. And then we'll run whatever's at that label. That might be easier, so let's do that right here. And let's um let's do that. We'll call this I don't know, hex code. I don't know if I want to do snake case or underscores or what, because I'm using underscores for the labels and I kinda want to differentiate. Um, right now, let's limit them to 255, right? <laughs> so let's do that. This goes out to 512. I'll make this 1024. Make it two sectors. 255 dB0, that should work. So that'll give us space. If they enter in something, if it's at the end of, in of user input, good, we'll execute. Otherwise, we're gonna print it the screen. Let's put it over there as well. Move into hex code. AL. And then we can, I guess we'll increment this. I don't know. We need something to point to hex code as well. Let's set DI to that. And print out that character to screen. That should be okay. Uh, we'll increment DI as well. Increment DI. Okay, if it's a 2, we're going to call print space. Print space is going to XOR CX again. So print it out 1, print it out 2, space, reset, and then go back. Okay. This we do. I'll put it here. Or rather, here. I guess we might want something else to say when we're done with this program, when we want to leave. So I suppose instead of a dollar for that, let's do something else. What other character, what special character do we want? Let's say a semicolon, which Emacs is terrible with. Thank you very much. Let's say they enter in a semicolon for this assembler. Well, let's not do that then. Let's do... Um, I guess we'll do a question mark, doesn't really matter. <laughs> it's all right. Uh, and program exit back to kernel. Let's do that. At the end of file, in program. Let's set that equal to the question mark. So let's try to put in our constants here. This is a constant, not a variable, I guess. 
I'm assuming. I don't think you can change the, uh, the EQU directive or whatever they call it. I don't think you can, but anyway, even if you can, I don't really feel like it should be possible. So let's just do this. That way I'll differentiate that character. I don't really want to be able to be changed. So I'm going to say it's in the non-changeable area, but we can compare to that. And this probably will not work and I'll have to change some things, but that's okay. In program, let's have end input as well. End input input. We'll say this is the dollar. End input. Okay, so if I enter in a dollar, it should go to execute. If I enter in a question mark, it should jump back to the kernel. Okay, otherwise every two characters it's going to print to the screen and then a space. I don't have any new lines right now. I might want to see what the new line or what the our, our limit for this text mode is 80 characters per line and 25 lines. So maybe I should compare to 80, keep a separate counter for 80. And when we reach 80 characters and print a new line, otherwise, I'm not sure if the text wraps or anything in this, uh, this text mode that we're doing. Not really sure we can. Um, all right, we can find out though, but I'm just going to print this out again. Call print string, execute input. We can print out testing. We can take in character, I guess. I don't know. H, 10 H. We'll take in a keystroke. We'll get a keystroke here. This will be 16 actually. To execute the input. Then I guess we'll we'll clear the screen and go back. Actually, I want to go back to the start, right? Reset editor. Okay, so after we execute, we're gonna we're gonna reset the editor. That's fine. That should be what we do. Jump reset editor. That way they can execute whatever code they put in and then it'll reset for the next code to be put in. Okay. Right now it'll just say testing, I guess. Well, we don't need to do that. We don't need to print this out then. You can just say reset editor when they're done. So what we need to do here is convert. Yeah, convert to valid machine code. But we can see if this works so far. I want to print out to the screen, and then when they enter in a dollar sign, it should reset, or we enter in a question mark, it should go back to our kernel right now. Let's see if that works. Which it probably doesn't, but that's all right. Undefined symbol end input. Let's check something out here. How do I do Emacs commands? There we go. <laughs> Aha, so what happens if I do this? Invalid operand. Aha. Uh -huh. So that's how I do them. So that runs. Okay, okay. So I have to put constants at the top and variables at the bottom, maybe? That's all right. Let's put these at the top. I want to try this out and use these. So that is okay with me. It'll just look a little funky, but that is all right. And it runs. So let's see what happens when we try to run our editor command. One, two, three, four. We have nothing. So we should be able to enter in two and then it'll print a space. So one, two. It prints a space after everything. Okay. <laughs> what happens if we print to the end of the line? The end of the screen. So this should be 80 characters. It wraps. It wraps. So we're okay. All right. So end input was the dollar sign. Okay, that's good. And question mark should go back to the kernel. All right, so I did not do that right. If it's input, yes, otherwise. Oh, we're not doing anything with question mark. Well, that's why. <laughs> Need to jump equal to end editor. Let's see if this works. Put that in question mark. Uh, didn't do anything. Oh, I had to, <laughs> I'm taking a character first. 
Yeah, taking this in. Uh, let's get rid of that requirement. At least for now. Because I want it to be fast and seamless. Bam, we're back. Nice. Okay, we're good. All right. So how come we enter in one character? Increment DI. Increment CX compared to two. I need to do jump equal. I'm doing a call. But then I have to have a place go back. I wish there was a call equal command. That'd be awesome. I need a command that says, are we good? Are we equal? Do we have a zero in the zero flag set? Then call this, by which I mean push the address on the stack, jump to it, and then go back. But this doesn't have that. That's annoying. All right. So I'll need a return. I don't, I don't really need this. I can do a better thing later, but oh well. Return from space. Jump. Return from outer space. Return from space jam. So this should be only two characters. Oh, one, two, space, one, two, one, two. Nice. Zero E, F, A. Should probably have this limited to uppercase, maybe. I guess we need to just jump to DI and then that would load everything. I'm not sure. I guess we would need to put in the machine code for return and return to this address, right? And then when we execute the stuff we put in, when that instruction pointer comes to, you know, a return that we input, then it'll return back. I guess that's what we need to do. Interesting. Not sure how I want to do that. And a program. We'll probably have to change this later, that's okay. So we'll reset DI to the start of the input, but we want to execute whatever the user put in. Let's do something else. Let's move into, I'm going to make another folder. I don't know if I'll include it as part of my git or anything. I can add it to git ignore, I guess, but I'm going to make a folder right now. Um, just called test. We're going to make a, um, a small thing just to see what happens. So let's see what happens if we jump repeatedly. Actually, let's do CLI and halt. Let's do that. I want something that we can look at and see what the hex code is. And that's something really simple that we can put in and see if it works in our program. So I want to clear interrupt and halt CPU. Okay, we'll just do that, and then we'll run phasm, and we'll see what the generated output is. So this is all we have. One pass, two bytes. So this is F4 and FA. F4 will be CLI, FA would be halt, I assume. We can test that by saying, just get rid of it. Yeah. So zero zero F four. So F four is halt. If we clear the interrupts first, it's F four and F A. I guess because it's little Indian, this shows up first, and then this because they both go into one word. So I need to get where this memory address is that hex code is pointing to, which I guess I already have because that's what the label is pointing to. Okay, so I think I guess just to run what we did, we can jump to it. So let's just jump. Um, DI, or maybe just jump hex code. Maybe we could just jump hex code. If we go to reset editor, DI will be reset, so maybe this will work. And if we get back, we'll reset. Although, I don't think the dollar will do anything, so I don't think I need to do that either. And also, I think we can put this on the same line. Looks a little jank, but that's all right. We'll see how this does. I'll try putting in F4FA. Um, we'll see if this works. Okay. F4FA. Dollar sign. 
MS-DOS compatibility FPU exception. Interesting. Did it halt? It did not halt. That halted. Keyword buffer is not doing anything. Okay. Maybe I should put an FA and then F4. Maybe we'll see if that does it. FA F4. It should be halting now. Yep. Okay. So I think that does work though, because it is halting. Okay, so let's put in something a little bit different, just to check and make sure. Let's move to our test. All right, so instead of, I don't need jump label, instead of doing that, let's do, um, let's move into AX. We'll do the same thing. We'll print out a T, just to make sure. I think 54 was the, the ASCII code for T. So we'll print out a T, and then we'll halt. But we can also try and clear the screen as well. Let's move into AX. 0600H XOR CX with itself move into DX 2580 is that oh, it's 19 and hex and 80 is 50 in hex 1950 I can run in 10 okay that should clear the screen And then we'll move a T into there. And then we'll halt. 16 bytes. Okay. So let's try entering this in and then seeing if it works. I'll try it first like this, although it's in Little Indian, so maybe it won't work, but I'll try it like this, and then I'll try B8, 0, if it doesn't, and I'll enter it in the other Indian way. Get my old snipping tool here. Yeah, there we go. I'll just save that over on the other screen, and then I can enter it in. Haha. <laughs> BAC9. I am not converting these to hex, so this probably will not work. I'm putting the ASCII character in. These are not the hex characters. I just realized that. I would have to put in the decimal equivalents. <laughs> so this is definitely not going to work. That's all right. 54BA. Let's see what happens anyway. CD0E F410. Enter. Enter doesn't do anything either. And let's run it. Yeah, a whole lot of nothing. A whole lot of garbage. That's good. All right, let's, let's, uh, yeah. Well, that would explain a lot. If I enter it in, DI, it has to be hex first. So I have to convert ASCII to hex. ASCII to hex. Let's write code down here for that. So when I input into the memory area, what I have to do is convert first. So I have to convert AL to hex. Jump equal end editor, otherwise call ask you to hex so we need to convert to hex so we have numbers or letters um, if we have number we need to treat them differently too and depending if we're doing lowercase or uppercase so what we can do is compare al to which be hex 39 actually what we could also do is just compare it to zero that would be easier wouldn't it let's just do this <laughs> All right, and then less than or equal hex number. Otherwise, we'll say it's hex letter. Get hex num, and all we need to do there is subtract 30. Because if they enter to zero, subtracting, since a zero in ASCII is hexadecimal 30, if we subtract hexadecimal 30, we'll have a hex zero, which is what they entered. So we'll subtract. Um, a 30, or subtract a 0 from it. I don't know which would be easier in this, or easier to understand. I guess we'll do this. Uh, and then we'll jump back. Let's just do call. Yeah, I'll just jump back. We'll jump back to return from hex num. 
to go back here. I'm not doing this in a very good way, as you can see, but this is off the top of my head stream of consciousness right now, so that is all right. Otherwise, we have... Put it right here. Otherwise, we have hex A through F. So, hexadecimal, if we do capital letters, let's just say that. Capital ASCII A starts at hex 41. Capital ASCII Z is hex 5A, okay, or 90 in decimal. So we're going to assume, or at least start in at 41, so we should have to, decimal A is decimal 10, so we have to subtract 31. Well, we only want to go through F, don't we? Yeah. We only need to do A through F. So A is hex 41, 65 in decimal, F is 70 in decimal. If we subtract 55 from 70, we get 15, which is F. Yeah. So we just have to subtract 55 then, in that case. Uh, 55 in decimal, or uh, 37 in hex. All right, then after we return, what we can do is go back. Called ASCII to hex, we'll return. And it'll return, put the character into DI, and then increment and go on. So that should be okay. We just subtract one or the other number. I guess I need to put something at the end of the hex code, though, to return back, but uh, that'll be later. Okay, right now we'll see if this works. I'll just do a return. We'll jump to there, which will be a return statement. Which will go back to here and do all that. Okay. So we'll try and entering this stuff again, and it'll hopefully print a T and be all right. Let's find out. I'm doing this in the wrong order. Let's do int 10 first. <laughs> if they don't end the editor, then I want to print stuff out. All right. 410. Now we'll enter in a dollar sign and it should run it. Not recognized in virtual mode, real or virtual. Well, it's running something. I figure we would be all right here, but apparently not. Jumping to the hex code is not great. Let's try putting in what we put. And then jump into this just to see if it works. And then we'll try entering it in. And that's all hexadecimal. Big old hexadecimal string. All right. So instead of jumping to hex code, let's jump to hex test and see what happens. Value out of range. Nice. Because that's way more than a byte. I'm assuming that's what it meant and wanted. Undefined symbol, B8. That's not, let's try something else. Let's try something else. We will jump to hex code. Not recognized. Well, obviously I got some debugging to do. We're almost somewhat kind of the way there, so. <laughs> Okay, I got this working. Let me actually get some better lighting here first. All right, if it's not too orangey looking, because <laughs> I have to mess with saturation values and stuff on my webcam, um, I got this working. I'm going to run through it right quick and then run it and show you. Comparing, you know, if they're at the end of input, then execute it. If they did a question mark, we're going to run back to the kernel and do that. Otherwise, we're going to print out their character to screen. So this is where the changes occurred. I'm going to call my ASCII to hex, convert to hexadecimal, then I'm going to increment our byte counter. So that's where we'd enter, after we've entered in two hex bytes, it's going to go into our hex code segment. I made a hex byte area which holds our temporary byte, which will hold, you know, the first byte in AL, then when they enter in the second byte, we're going to move it into this hex byte segment, and then we're going to move the hex byte segment into the hex code memory. So I'm putting in basically, since hexadecimal digits are nibbles, that's what I forgot and that's what I had to work through. Hexadecimal digits take up four bits each, so you need two of those to make one byte. And I was putting in each one as it occurred as one single byte. So instead of hex F4, I was putting in F and then 4, which would be 0F and 04 in hex. Here, if they didn't enter in two bytes yet, we're just moving the first byte into our hex byte, which will be the first nibble. Otherwise, we go to the second one, we eat the second nibble, and move it into the hex area. Okay. Um, I do need to find a way to get back to here to reset, but until then, right now we're just executing a line. So, assuming we already have one nibble inside of our hex byte memory here, 
our put hex byte is going to rotate um, that byte, or our hex nibble, going to rotate left four bits. So if we think of this as, um, do I have a scratch buffer? By default, I do. So what we're doing is, um, if, if we have something like F4, which is halt, if we do that one at a time, we'll get 0F and 04. So we want to get one hex a decimal, you know, byte of F4. So what we do is first move it into hex byte. So we first enter in an F that goes into our hex byte memory. So that equals 0F at this point. And then we're going to rotate that left by four bits, which will then equal F0 which is a great game series that Nintendo needs to bring back, but that's all right. Then we're going to lot, uh, we're going to bitwise or this F zero that's in our hex byte memory, our data at the memory and hex byte. We're going to or that with AL, which will be our next hex digit, which is in this case is a four. So we're going to or our F zero with zero four. So it'll equal one, 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 zero, 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 zero. And it'll be ORed with zero, 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 one, zero, zero, right? And then this will make every everything a zero or a one equates to a one and a zero or a zero equates to a zero. So if there's a one anywhere, it'll end up a one in the final answer. But this will basically end up being one, 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 zero, one, zero, zero. And this is F4. So that's what we're, we're doing here. Rotate left, we're orient it to get the second nibble in the second place. Um, we need to move that into the hex code data area, which DI is pointing to the start of that. Um, but we can't move memory to memory, so I can't do bracket DI. I can't do move bracket DI, move hex byte, so I have to move it to another area first. So I do the equivalent of moving an immediate value of hex byte into AL, and then I move that into DI, into the data and memory that DI is pointing to, and then I increment. DI's address, and then, you know, we do the rest. We XOR CX to reset the byte counter since we've input two nibbles or one hex byte. We print a space on the screen, and then we jump back to return from hex, which is here, which just jumps to get next hex character. Okay, so to be able to show you that that works, we'll go back to antiterm, make it make run. Oh, I also found out <laughs> this is how CWM works in uh, OpenBSD. You know how I was annoyed that the screen kept moving whenever I run box? Well, the reason is that it, the window will spawn wherever my cursor is. So if I keep my cursor here in the middle of the screen, um, then the box window will spawn in the middle of the screen where my cursor is. And now that I figured that out, I can have, you know, less trouble with that. But if we enter our editor, four spaces. And I put in, um, I, I just made code to um, to clear the screen and print a T. And that is what this is. So I'll be entering in this and then it will halt. So I'm entering in everything as uppercase right now as well. I should probably make room for lowercase later and convert that as, as well. But I haven't done that yet. But if I just type in, if I just type this in as is, it will be in the correct Indianness format. So it will run. Okay, so here's that line of code written out here. I'm going to press shift four to get the dollar sign and that should run the code by jumping to Xcode memory and it should clear the screen and print a T. And it does. So uh, we have a working functional hex monitor. Now it only works for one input string at a time. And if you were to input the hex code to return back to this point, then it should work, but I haven't done that yet. Um, but I'll probably put that in to put in a return to whatever this point is. Um, I'll add that in hex to the end of whatever we typed, and then that should return to input another hex thing, I guess. I'll probably put to get a keystroke and then return. So I'll put that in whatever the machine code bytes are in here. But I'll, uh, I'll do that on my next video. Uh, but we got it working, which I think is call for celebration. So I got it. This is a nitro can, so this might spill everywhere. <laughs> we'll see. Oh, that sounded nice. And we are, oh, you're not even seeing it. Get this beautifulness. I, I didn't pour it right at all, so it's just all head right now, but it's slowly gonna settle. But anyway, I'm celebrating. <sighs> that is a nitro um, black Scottish stout Belhaven. Belhaven black, Scottish stout. Kind of like a Guinness, kind of different.
Um, not as smoky as a Guinness, but it's on nitro and it's very smooth and I like it. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, that has nothing to do with the rest of this. I just wanted to drink that because I finally did something after, you know, debugging stuff for a while because I'm an idiot, but that's okay. Um, but we got a hex monitor working, guys. So I'm going to, in the next video, I'll get that to where it should automatically come back here to input multiple lines. And then um, after that, I might work on a couple more like prompt or shell commands and we'll go from there. But anyway, thank you guys for watching. I know this is long and I ramble a lot and it takes a while. Maybe you watch the videos on two times speed or you fall asleep from my monotone voice. But thank you very much. I do very much appreciate it. And um, I'll see you on the next one.